Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the PolyISO Continuous Insulation Wall Systems, The Perfect Wall. I'm Gina Carosa, and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. Today we will discuss how PolyISO Continuous Insulation Wall Systems can address the changing codes that are having a major impact on builders. This presentation will help to take the guesswork out of what makes a perfect wall in all different applications. Joining me today is J.R. Babineau and Kathy Mick, who will take you through the details to help you understand the science behind the systems for different polyiso continuous insulation applications. I'd now like to turn it over to our co-presenters, J.R. and Kathy, who will take a few moments to introduce themselves. Thanks, Gina, and hi, everybody, and thanks for attending our webinar today. My name is J.R. Babineau, and I'm a research manager and the principal building scientist for Johns Manville in our corporate R&D group. For over 20 years, I've been doing research and leading development projects in building materials with a focus on how we control heat, air, moisture, noise, and energy use in buildings. I manage our product performance labs, but I also provide education and consulting to JAM customers on building science issues. My educational background is in physics and engineering management, and I'm also a licensed engineer in Colorado. Kathy? Hello everyone, my name is Kathy Mix and I am the product manager responsible for both the poly ISO wall systems and spray foam portfolios for Johns Manville. I have a technical background and graduated with a BS in engineering from the Colorado School of Mines. I worked for 10 years in aerospace and then spent several years raising kids and coaching high school volleyball before joining Johns Manville seven years ago and helping launch our wall systems business. I'm happy to be with you today to share some information that I hope will broaden your insulation knowledge and help you and your business grow. Thank you for taking part in this presentation on polyiso continuous insulation wall systems. JR is going to begin the session by explaining what thermal bridging is and how continuous insulation mitigates its negative effects. He will then illustrate how different types of continuous insulation are used to meet code requirements and compare their performance and cost effectiveness. I will then review the attributes that make PolyISO a perfect choice for continuous insulation applications, and then introduce the JM PolyISO product line. Next, we will examine how Johns Manville PolyISO products are used in building applications, followed with an in-depth look at the Johns Manville all-purpose continuous insulation wall system. Next, we will highlight the benefits of partnering with Johns Manville, and then wrap up by taking questions from the audience. JR? Please take it away. Thanks, Kathy. So, okay, we're going to jump right in. And first, we're going to have a couple of definitions. So, neither the building code nor the ASHRAE standards really officially define what a thermal bridge is, but we're going to use the definition on the slide. And that a thermal bridge is really any element in the building uh, that's got higher thermal conductivity than the materials around it, which basically lets heat flow around the insulation that we might otherwise be using. Um, on the continuous insulation side, though, both the energy code and the ASHRAE 90.1 standard have a definition for continuous insulation, and that is insulation that is continuous across all structural members without thermal bridges other than fasteners and service openings. And continuous insulation can be installed on either the interior or the exterior and is going to be integral to any kind of opaque part of the building envelope. And by that, we just mean something that's not a window or a door. So thermal bridges are most commonly caused by framing, kind of followed closely by exposed uh, concrete slab edges. And as we can see in the photos on the left, right, framing is pretty easy to spot while a project is still under construction. We see steel stud framing all over the place. But it's actually also really easy to see with an infrared camera long after the building is occupied. And the photo on the top right shows uh, an infrared image of a building where we can clearly see, especially on the second story, uh, wall framing ghosting right through. Ex exposed floor slabs, especially when we use them as balconies, really just end up acting like big cooling fins that take heat away from the inside of the building and cheerfully dump it outside to the wind. But continuous insulation, when it's installed properly, will cover all of the framing and actually should also cover slab edges and separate balconies from the rest of the structure. Uh, when it's installed in these areas, 
continuous insulation can effectively eliminate thermal bridges and many of the problems that they can cause. So to continue with this uh, theme for right now, um, right, both wood and steel framing can cause thermal bridges, but steel is by far the worst offender. Uh, the drawing on the left just shows kind of a, a little schematic of a simple three and a half inch thick wall. Um, if we were to frame that wall with wood framing, wood studs, um, at the framing area, we're going to get a, an R value from those materials of about R4. Now, the cavity insulation in there might be anywhere from R13 to 15, um, but that's still a lot more than the wood. On the other hand, steel studs really are the, the real problem, uh, and because they only deliver an R value of, let's say, a half, and it's really not even that much. They really let heat dump through. And when we really put this in a building, we can see that we get problems much more than just on the energy side of things. You know, number one, the framing in a typical wall can easily account for 25% of the total wall area. So when we're insulating the wall, we're really only able to insulate three quarters of it if we're just doing cavity insulation. And further, when we look at like the drawing on the far right where we show how steel studs might be grouped together for an outside corner and combine that with the photo right below, we can see where we can get really severe problems. So the photo here is actually of what was a closet, and uh, the dark spot back in the corner of that photo is actually mold. So thermal bridging through those steel studs created such a cold spot um, that condensation and then mold started to form. And in this situation, the clothes that were hanging in front of the wall on this closet actually were a more effective insulator than the insulation in the wall itself. So because thermal bridges are such a common and known problem, and because continuous insulation is such an effective treatment, uh, many building codes call for CI or recognize its many benefits. The primary code that calls for CI to be used is, as you would expect, the energy code. Reducing, reducing thermal bridging is really the main reason that CI is called for. Now, however, most continuous insulations also provide excellent air sealing, especially when seams are sealed and the products are integrated with other air barrier components. And in fact, most foam plastic continuous insulation materials are what are called deemed to comply air barrier materials by the energy code. And what this means is that if these materials are installed and again integrated with the rest of the air barrier, uh, things like whole building air leakage can be avoided. In addition to the energy code, the IBC and IRC codes also reference continuous insulation materials, and we're going to look at these topics more closely over the next few slides. But first, sticking with the energy code, um, before we dig into how and where insulation is called for, first we're going to have a little short refresher. Right? The key feature of the energy code in the U.S. are climate zones which divide up the country into regions of similar heating and cooling loads. The map on this slide shows the energy code climate zones for the U.S. As you can see, the higher the climate zone number, the colder the climate. And then any insulation requirements uh, that are called for by the code are going to be based on these climate zones. So as we've been talking about, uh, right, the energy code calls for CI materials for many parts of the building envelope. In this table, uh, what we focused on is just walls for commercial buildings, but, but this is not a comprehensive uh, list, right? That would be honestly too cumbersome to show on one slide. CI is really called for on walls and roofs and floors for both commercial and residential buildings. So if we look across the top of the table, we've got a number of different types of walls. We've got mass walls, which really include things like solid concrete or block. We've got metal framed walls, which are just steel stud walls. We've got wood framed walls, which are pretty self-explanatory. And finally, we have metal building walls. And metal buildings are like the pre-engineered metal buildings that we see uh, used as things like warehouses or agricultural buildings, things like that. The important thing to note here, first off, is that for all wall types, as we can see, there is some amount of continuous insulation called for in nearly every climate zone. And uh, the other thing to just point out real briefly is that, right, for each type of wall, we've actually got two columns underneath of it. 
Uh, one of those is for the International Energy Conservation Code, or IECC, and one is for ASHRAE Standard 90.1. Uh, not sure if everybody knows this, but the IECC is actually what gets adopted as code by jurisdictions. But within the IECC, uh, it actually recognizes ASHRAE 90.1 as equivalent, even though as we look at just the table, a lot of the numbers are different. Um, that's okay, they're just developed by separate, um, separate organizations, separate groups of people. Um, in general, as we can see, ASHRAE 90.1 has got some less stringent insulation requirements, and so oftentimes commercial buildings are designed uh, using 90.1 as their kind of energy code compliance path. But overall, right, the need for CI is clearly already in the market and it is definitely growing. So, right, we looked earlier um, at how thermal bridging can cause condensation problems, that photo in from the, uh, of the closet. And the building code recognizes that if we add continuous insulation, we're gonna reduce the condensation risks inside the wall. And what that means is that in cold climates, if CI is used, we can usually eliminate the more common vapor retarders that we might use inside of a wall. And instead, we can just use latex paint as uh, kind of our vapor control uh, inside the system. But to qualify, we need to look at a table like the one on the slide. And there are very similar tables to this in both of the, the building codes. But what this shows us is that depending on the climate zone and how thick our wall is, there's a minimum amount of CI that's required uh, to, to allow us to kind of trade this material off against a vapor retarder. So in addition to being used as an air barrier and to just stop thermal bridging, uh, foam plastic continuous insulation materials are often also used as what's called the water resistive barrier or WRB. Um, since all walls have to have a WRB to prevent rainwater from getting in, the solid foam surface of these boards makes for a great drainage plane. Using continuous insulation as the WRB allows for the elimination of other WRB materials like building wraps, peel and stick membranes, or fluid applied WRBs. And this can result in a significant labor and material savings. Again, just like uh, for the air barrier piece, right, if we're gonna use uh, CI as the WRB, all the seams have to be taped or sealed. Uh, we've got to integrate with window and door flashings and any other penetrations need to be sealed up to make sure we don't get rain getting in behind uh, the material. So now shifting gears a little bit, uh, right in addition to all of the heat, air, and moisture benefits from continuous insulation, some foam plastic products can actually also resist wind loads, which can then eliminate the need for separate sheathing behind it like exterior gypsum. This can be another great opportunity for cost savings, but it's really important that the manufacturer uh, has the appropriate testing and approvals. The photo actually on this slide shows the final stage of an air leakage and wind resistance test on one of Johns Mandel's products, our AP foil faced foam sheathing. Um, the wall that we see here in the photo is just using one inch thick polyiso foam over 18 gauge steel studs uh, with the seams taped, no additional sheathing or anything on the other side of that wall at all. At the final stage of the testing that we did for this wall, uh, the vacuum on the other side is actually cranked down uh, at this point until the steel studs began to buckle, at which point we stopped the test uh, for safety reasons. But during that whole process, uh, neither the foam sheathing nor the tape seams ever failed during the test. Um, and at this point, the air pressure on the wall was equivalent to a 200 mile per hour wind or a category four hurricane. So these products clearly can stand up to a lot more load than we might think they would uh, with being foam plastics. So finally, uh, along with all of the benefits of continuous insulation, the code addresses any potential safety issues, especially regarding the use of foam plastics. Uh, most CI products are some kind of foam plastics, wh plastic which will burn in a fire, and so the code requires a number of fire performance criteria to be met. Uh, in the IBC, the commercial code, uh, chapter 26 covers these requirements, and the first is related to foam plastics being exposed to the occupied space of the building. Uh, most foam plastics have to actually be covered with a, what's called a thermal barrier, such as gypsum board, 
if they're going to be on the interior of a building. Products, however, that have passed a special, it's called the NFPA 286 room corner burn test, uh, might be allowed to be left exposed. Kathy is actually going to talk about that more later in relation to one of Johns Manville's products. Foam plastics are also required to be tested for things like heat content and flame spread and smoke developed in the E84 tunnel test. These tests are required kind of regardless where the products are used. And then finally, if foam plastic uh, continuous insulation is going to be used in an exterior wall that is otherwise non-combustible, so think concrete walls, steel walls, you know, things like that, then the whole assembly actually has to be tested to, what, to the test that's called NFPA 285. And this is actually a really important test because it simulates a two-story wall in a situation where an apartment fire has blown out the window and now the fire has the opportunity to spread to upper floors using the space between the wall cladding and the rest of the wall. So materials that pass this test have to limit the spread of both flame and temperature vertically and sideways. And the passing results from a test like this usually involve a table of acceptable wall components. And it's really important that any of the installed walls in the field um, fall within the limits of a given test report. And again, Kathy will touch on that in a little more detail later. So now that we've talked about the benefits of continuous insulation, and where it comes up in the building codes, and we're gonna take a look at some of the various types of continuous insulation. So the slide that we have here has several photos of the more common materials out there. Uh, starting at the top left, we've got uh, kind of a couple of photos of polyisocyanurate foam sheathing. Uh, these are the, the foil face products in the, in the pictures. On the lower left is a photo of extruded polystyrene, which is the blue board on the building in the photo. Uh, in the lower right, we've got several photos of closed cell spray polyurethane foam that's actually been sprayed right onto the outside of a building. And then finally, the photo in the upper right is of Johns Manville's Cladstone product, which is a semi-rigid mineral wool board that can be also used as CI. All right, so next we're going to compare and contrast uh, the various types of continuous insulation. And what we'd like to do at this point in the webinar is really focus on why we feel that polyiso is one of the most high-performing and cost-effective options out there. So across the top of the table, right, we've listed, again, the more common materials, expanded polystyrene, or EPS, extruded polystyrene, or XPS, polyiso, uh, exterior spray foam, and mineral wool. And what we're going to basically do is just kind of march our way down the rows looking at the different functions. So we talked earlier, right, a couple different times about how if board seams are taped, Many CI materials can act as both the water-resistive barrier, or WRB, and the air barrier. Uh, the exception to this uh, is mineral wool. So even though mineral wool repels water very well, uh, it doesn't really, it's not a solid drainage layer. And so mineral wool CI uh, usually needs to have a separate air barrier and drainage layer typically behind the product, right, because it's also going to be in front of um, exterior gypsum. Uh, for air barrier performance, I think the key thing here is to really look for certifications and listings with the Air Barrier Association of America. And ABAA certification uh, really tells you that that product has been tested as a system uh, to make sure it's going to deliver very high performance uh, levels of both water leakage and uh, air, uh, air sealing. Next. Um, Looking at below grade, all of the CI materials listed in this table actually can be used below grade. So that would be to insulate, um, you know, crawl space walls, foundation walls, right, things where the material um, might be in contact with the soil. Ideally, there's a, a you know, a drainage break in front of it, um, but, uh, but in either case, it could be exposed to a much more severe climate there. Um, again, polyiso uh, can be used below grade but uh, it should have either foil or coated glass facers for that application. Moving on down um, to whether things can be a vapor retarder, and really vapor permeability is one of the areas where the various materials can start to differ greatly. Uh, mineral wool, CI on one end of the spectrum is very vapor open. 
uh, as is expanded polystyrene or EPS. Um, extruded polystyrene, closed cell spray foam, and polyiso all actually tend to perform pretty similarly in this range of between one and two perms unless the polyiso has foil facers. So in this case, the foil facer is what really brings that perm rating of the product down to almost zero. But these can actually be some pretty useful differences if we're trying to tailor the, desi the design of the wall and how it's going to deal with moisture. A great example would be if we have a wall in a warm climate uh, and it's a brick veneer wall, so like a normal steel stud wall with brick veneer in front of it. Um, if we have that system in a warm, humid climate, like let's say Houston, the low perm polyiso will actually prevent moisture from outside and from the cladding itself from being driven into the rest of the wall. Uh, R values are another key area of difference between materials. The common products range from R4 per inch up to about R7. And we'll dig into this in a little bit more uh, detail here in a minute, how that can be an important aspect of cost effectiveness for the wall design. Next, being able to resist wind loads and potentially eliminate exterior gypsum, right, is another important consideration. Again, AP foil faced polyiso from Johns Manville has these approvals. Other foam sheathings might as well. Um, right, things like exterior spray foam actually have to have that exterior gypsum because that's what they're going to be sprayed onto. And finally, all of the foam plastics that we've listed up here have varying levels of fire performance. But one thing to keep in mind is that polyiso and spray foams are both what are called thermoset foams, which means that while they might burn, they're not going to melt or drip burning liquid during a fire event. And this is a really an important distinction between these products and polystyrenes, which actually can melt. And then finally, mineral wool, as we show, is non-combustible, so fire to that product is kind of a non-issue. So we mentioned on the previous slide how different CI materials have different R values, but what does this really mean when we get it onto the building? So the main thing to keep in mind is that the lower the R value per inch of a material, the thicker the CI is going to have to be to hit whatever the R value target is. And looking at just the three most common CI materials, EPS, XPS, and polyiso foam, right, we're going to work from kind of the safe assumption um, that EPS is going to be about R4 per inch, uh, XPS is R5 per inch, and polyiso is R6 per inch. Sometimes these numbers vary a little bit, but usually not uh, in a dramatic way. But if we use that, um, what we see is that for different R values uh, that we might need on the wall, right, R5, R7.5, these numbers show up in the code for condensation control and energy all the time, we, get, we need different thicknesses of material, right? At low R values, the differences aren't huge. But as the needs of the wall get higher, these differences become significant and can really impact the overall cost of the system. Right, so needing thicker foam to get to an R value target actually comes with a host of other additional costs. Right, things like insulation fasteners have to be longer. A cladding system attachments like brick ties or Z-girts or other sorts of standoffs have to be deeper. Shelf angles, if we're using a brick veneer, um, have to be longer and larger, heavier. You know, windows might even need to be repositioned uh, or need extra support so that you can, we can properly align the drainage of the window with uh, the drainage onto the foam. And all of this can lead to extra costs. But the key thing here is that because polyiso has one of the highest R values per inch of any of the CI materials, these extra costs can be minimized. The table at the bottom of the slide shows the cost savings that could be realized with polyiso just by looking at the three accessories that we talked about at the beginning, uh, insulation fasteners, basic brick ties, and shelf angles. So we can see that as the R value on the wall goes up, the savings from using polyiso versus the other foams also increases because we get to keep using shorter accessories for a higher R value system. And right, so uh, two, three percent, uh, right, four percent as we march our way up. And these numbers might not seem like a huge amount, but when we're talking about a building that might have tens of thousands of square feet of opaque wall area, it really does add up. And then right in the last column, we've added the potential savings from also eliminating the exterior gypsum board. 
And of course, that's a very significant bump, right? We're, taught, we're looking at nearly 10% um, savings just from the, all of the other fastener things being shorter and the gypsum being gone. All right, so it's really just a small reminder that when we think about these systems, the CI foam by itself isn't the only piece that's going to impact cost effectiveness. So finally, to summarize the first half of today's webinar, uh, we've reviewed thermal bridges, talked about what causes them, uh, what the, the benefits of continuous insulation are right, in reducing thermal bridging, reducing condensation risks, improving comfort, and reducing energy use. Um, we talked about how the code calls for CI in some cases and also just how the building code will allow for CI to be used as things like an air barrier or a water resistive barrier, means to eliminate things like vapor retarders or even eliminate the use of exterior gypsum sheathing. Uh, then we looked at fire code requirements uh, for foam plastics, right, really again looking at the differences between polystyrenes that might melt and drip versus polyiso or spray foams that will char and stay in place. And finally, we looked at comparing polyiso foam against other materials, looking at how polyiso's higher R per inch can allow for thinner foam, which also leads to savings from shorter fasteners, cladding attachments, shelf angles, overall a more cost-effective wall system. Now, in the next part of the webinar, Kathy is going to take us through a more detailed look at the wide range of applications that we can use JM Polyiso Foam CI in and talk about the resources available from JM to make it easier to use our CI products. Kathy? Thank you, JR. Next, we'll take a closer look at the performance attributes of Polyiso. As JR noted, at R6 per inch, polyiso has the highest thermal performance of any other rigid insulation board. XPS is R5 per inch and EPS is R4 per inch. This means more energy savings and or more manageable wall thicknesses. Thinner, energy efficient walls using polyiso create more usable floor area within the footprint of the building. Also, cladding materials are more easily installed and at a lower cost over continuous insulation products with thinner profiles. Simply put, there's more value per dollar with polyiso continuous insulation versus other rigid board insulations. Polyiso is also naturally moisture resistant. With the proper facer and seam treatment, it can function as a water barrier and vapor retarder as required by climate or code compliant wall design preferences. In the past, XPS has been widely used in below grade applications largely because it's moisture resistant. However, polyiso also meets liquid water and vapor barrier requirements and delivers a higher R value, so it's actually a higher performing choice for below grade applications. Polyiso is not a food source for mold and unlike XPS and EPS, is resistant to the solvents used in construction adhesives. It also has excellent dimensional stability, which is critical for exterior wall applications. Polyiso is the top choice among other rigid insulation boards when it comes to fire resistance. As JR explained, it is a thermoset material which meets all fire safety codes and can be safer in a fire situation versus XPS and EPS, which are thermoplastic materials. And lastly, polyiso is manufactured with an environmentally friendly, non-halogenated blowing agent and therefore has zero ozone depletion potential and very low global warming potential. All of these advantages demonstrate the superior value of polyiso continuous insulation, which brings us to the next slide. Johns Manville added polyiso continuous insulation to its offering in 2012 due to the many advantages just discussed. We currently have five manufacturing locations across North America and have two main products for wall systems and one main product for residential roofing. The first product on the left is AP Foil. AP is short for all purpose and foil refers to the facer. AP foil has a polyiso foam core which is bonded on each side to a foil facer. One side is reflective and the other side is non-reflective. It has a listing report with ICC, the International Code Council for residential and commercial construction. The listing covers thermal performance as well as air and water barrier and vapor retarder approvals. AP Foil also has Air Barrier Association of America approval, which is an important listing for high-end commercial construction. 
APFOIL can be used in interior or exterior applications and must be separated from the interior with sheetrock or other 15-minute thermal barrier. The second wall product is CI Max. CI is short for continuous insulation and Max refers to its superior performance. CI Max is a high efficiency rigid foam sheathing designed for exposed interior applications. It also has a polyiso foam core bonded on each side to glass mat reinforced embossed aluminum facers. It's available in white or silver finish and the embossing gives it a really attractive appearance. CI Max is approved for use without a thermal barrier and provide, provides an aesthetic and highly durable interior finish. It's suitable for wall or ceiling applications in residential, commercial, agricultural, and industrial buildings. CI Max is covered under the same ICC listing as AP Foil. And the last product shown here is a roofing product, R Panel. R is short for roof. Because our panel is used on low slope roof applications, it's outside the scope of this seminar, but I just wanted to mention that it's available and has FM, UL, and Miami-Dade code approval. And now we'll get to where polyiso is used. JAM polyiso is approved for use in residential, commercial, agricultural, and industrial construction. It can be used on exterior, interior, or below grade applications in walls, ceilings, and floors. JAM polyiso can be attached to all substrates including wood, steel, metal, and masonry. The next several slides will examine these applications in greater detail. The most common polyiso continuous insulation application is in exterior walls. With proper detailing, continuous insulation can be used in any exterior wall assembly. And this graphic shows three common assemblies. The assembly on the left shows a wood framed wall. This is a common wall type in residential or type five commercial construction. The wall cavity can be empty or filled with insulation, and polyiso can be installed over exterior sheathing, usually OSB, or directly to the wood studs. The polyiso can function as the air and water barrier, as we'll see later, and then the cladding is attached over the polyiso to the framing. The assembly in the middle shows a steel framed wall. This is a common wall type in commercial, type one through four construction. Similar to the first assembly, the wall cavity can be empty or filled with insulation, and polyiso can be installed over exterior sheathing such as gypsum or directly to the steel studs. The polyiso can function as air and water barrier and then the cladding is attached over the polyiso to the framing. NFPA 285 approval is required for type one through four assemblies greater than 18 meters tall and we'll discuss the 285 approval in more detail in a bit. The assembly on the right shows a mass or masonry substrate. In this assembly, the masonry or concrete can be the exterior cladding, or the interior finished wall. There's no cavity fill in this assembly, so all of the insulation needs to be continuous. As you can see, poly -ISO CI can be used with a variety of wall systems and cladding materials. CI can be placed on the interior or exterior of the wall with proper consideration of vapor control requirements. For example, it is common to use continuous insulation on the inside face of foundation walls and also above grade masonry walls. This is a typical practice in Florida where the exterior masonry wall face is coated with stucco. Also, it's possible to use continuous insulation alone to meet energy code without any cavity insulation at all. So these are some schematics of two residential and commercial type five exterior wall applications. The schematic on the left is new construction showing AP foil installed over OSB with fiberglass cavity fill and wood framing. The schematic on the right is a retrofit where AP foil is installed over existing siding. The AP foil would then be covered with new cladding. This schematic shows a commercial exterior wall application. As we have learned, type one through four commercial applications require NFPA 285 approval. The table on the right is the AP FOIL 285 complying walls table. It lists the allowed materials for each part of the wall assembly. The materials are broken out by component types, including base wall, floor line fire stopping, cavity insulation, exterior sheathing, water resistive barrier applied to the exterior sheathing, exterior insulation, and exterior wall covering. Manufacturers are required to, per, to perform third-party testing and obtain third-party approval for all assemblies represented in this table. Only materials listed in the table are allowed. 
the complying walls table is included in the product evaluation service report. Designers, general contractors, contractors, and code officials are all responsible to ensure that built walls meet the complying walls table. JM has many options for interior wall and ceiling applications. AP foil can be installed in occupied spaces when covered by a 15-minute thermal barrier or in unoccupied attics when covered by an improved ignition barrier. CI Max has NFPA 286 approval and so can be installed in occupied and unoccupied spaces without a thermal or ignition barrier. CI Max is approved for use in either wall or ceiling applications but not both wall and ceiling within the same space. These schematics show some of Johns Manville's PolyISO approved wall and ceiling applications. Detailed instructions for each application are available on jm.com. These are some installed photos of CI Max. The photo on the far left and top right are of a distribution center in the east installed with a trim kit. The photo on the bottom left is another distribution center in the west installed with our matching white tape. And the other two photos are of an agricultural cold storage building in Washington. GM also has many options for below grade applications. AP foil can be installed below grade on the exterior as shown in the schematic on the left. It can also be installed on walls or ceilings of a crawl space when covered by either thermal or ignition barrier as required by code. As discussed earlier, PolyISO is a high performing choice for below grade versus XPS. Again, detailed instructions for all of these applications are available on jm.com. So we've seen that JM Poly ISO can be used in many applications, but the most common application by far is in exterior walls. The popularity of Johns Manville Poly ISO in these applications is because of all the attributes that we've discussed earlier. JM has leveraged these attributes into a high-performing, patented wall system, which we call the Johns Manville All-Purpose wall system. The system features AP foil, which function, functions as a water-resistive barrier, vapor retarder, and air barrier, eliminating the need for separate barrier components. It can also eliminate the need for exterior sheathing, such as gypsum or OSB. Because it has a very broad offering of qualified assemblies, the JM All-Purpose Continuous Insulation Wall Systems gives professionals the flexibility to optimize their design according to their priorities. This is a schematic of the JM All-Purpose CI wall system. The two boxes list the components that make up the system. Not all components are necessary. The blue box in the middle are the components that are offered by Johns Manville. Looking at the schematic, beginning on the back side, which represents the interior face of the wall, is the interior wall board. The next component is the structure, which can be concrete, concrete masonry unit, steel, or wood stud. Next is the cavity fill, which can include fiberglass, blowing wool, mineral wool, spray foam, cellulose, or the cavity can be left empty. Next is the exterior sheathing, which can be OSB gypsum or can be eliminated. Next is AP foil, which is installed with Johns Manville fasteners and tape to create an air, water, and vapor barrier. Lastly is the exterior cladding, which can be brick, stucco, natural stone, concrete, or terracotta. We call this the perfect wall because it is cost effective and can be tailored to meet the customer's needs. This slide highlights the advantages of the JM All-Purpose CI wall system. The high thermal performance of AP foil leads to thinner walls, which have a lower installed cost and fewer complications installing windows, doors, and penetrations. Alternatively, a higher R value could be achieved for the same thickness as XPS or EPS. Because AP foil is multifunctional, fewer components are required to achieve the same level of performance. For example, exterior sheathing can be eliminated in some applications, as can the independent WRB and air barrier. Because the JM wall system uses specially designed fasteners, 30 to 50 percent fewer fasteners are required versus competing systems, and I'll touch on this a bit more in a few slides. The system is extremely versatile. We have a broad range of cavity insulations and exterior claddings qualified with the JM wall system. Here's some photos of the JM all-purpose CI wall system in various applications. The building on the left is a plasma center in Atlanta. The building in the middle is a house in Colorado. The building on the upper right is a medical center in Colorado. And the building 
and the lower right is a school in North Carolina. These are the JAM components that make up the CI wall system. AP foil face polyiso is available in one half to four and a half inch thicknesses and an eight, nine, or 10 foot length. Boards greater than one inch thick can also be scored. The blue plates in the photo are two inch diameter and have been designed to maximize the force needed to pull through the board. This results in fewer fasteners being required to resist the wind loads that JR discussed. Fewer fasteners reduce cost, labor, and installation time. The plate also has a recessed seat for the fastener so that the air seal can be easily obtained over the fastener. A photo from our initial tape screening evaluations is shown in the lower right. We evaluated many different tapes for adhesion, elasticity, UV exposure, weathering and aging, and air barrier performance before selecting 3M's acrylic tape. In the photo, you can see how the tape remains adhered to the board and stretches without tearing the board or the tape, thus preserving the integrity of the air and water barrier. The tape and the entire system is designed to last the life of the building. JAM has put together cell sheets for several of our most popular assemblies in order to help our customers with the specification, sales, installation, and approval process. Two stucco assemblies are shown here, and all assemblies are available on our website. So this is a fastener pattern for two different wall applications. The pattern on the left is for AP foil installed over exterior sheathing with 24 inch on center stud framing. The pattern on the right is for AP foil installed directly to the framing with 16 inch on center spacing. This is just a quick look at the level of detail included in our installation instructions, which provide best practice guidance for performance as well as material and installation efficiencies. Likewise, this is a look at the level of flashing detail provided in order to create air and water barrier transitions. The instructions include written as well as visual guidance. So that wraps up the product portion of our webinar. Now we'd like to spend a few moments reviewing all of the services that JM offers. JAM has an expansive technical support team. As you can see here, we have your bases covered, whether it be helping with building science, an architect, securing a large commercial job, helping write a letter to a building inspector or concerned homeowner, securing a builder's work, talking to an expert or expediting parts. We have folks on call ready to help you. And this is a comprehensive list of the key polyiso contacts and the support services offered by JM. We have field technical services, parts and equipment, product management, sales, specifier services, engineering, research and development, building science, marketing, and technical services. We are all available to help you wherever we are needed. And then this map shows the location of our field technical team. These gentlemen are highly skilled and available to help on site, online, or on call. JAM has the most comprehensive insulation product portfolio in the industry. We offer fiberglass, mineral wool, blowing wool, polyiso continuous insulation, spray foam, and tile backer. All of these products are stocked in our building insulation plants so that our customers can mix loads and get multiple products delivered on one truck. So to summarize today's webinar, JR began by defining thermal bridging and continuous insulation. He then showed how continuous insulation is used to meet today's building codes, followed by a review of the different types of continuous insulation and how they compared from a performance and cost perspective. Next, I discussed the attributes of polyiso CI and introduced you to the JM Polyiso product offering. We then saw all of the applications for Johns Manville Polyiso, residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural. Next, we learned about the JM all-purpose continuous insulation wall system and how it provides exceptional heat, moisture, and air control for your building's exterior envelope using a minimum number of components. And lastly, we wrapped up with a look at all of the services that JM offers in order to be your supplier of choice. Thank you, Kathy. I'd like to take a few minutes to go through some additional resources we have for you. We just launched our first e-newsletter, <clears throat> the JM Insulation Insider, about all things building insulation. Each quarter, you'll find that it is filled with informative articles 
about products, transportation, helpful tips and tools, events, industry news, and thoughts directly from JM leaders. We want this newsletter to be valuable for you, so please share your feedback and suggestions to help us improve. If for some reason you don't automatically receive an email about the newsletter, be sure to visit www.jminsulationinsider.com. I wanted to also mention that we will continue in 2019 to have our quarterly webinars. So look in your inbox in 2019 for our next webinar. And we also have a jm.com smart binder app that is available online or through your mobile device. Um, and it includes lots of useful information, SDSs, product data sheets, and other literature and case study information for you. So take a look at that. Thank you very much for attending today. And on behalf of Gina, JR, and the rest of the JM team, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. If you are a current customer, we thank you for your business. And if you're not a current customer, we'd like to talk with you about future partnership opportunities. Thank you.